Hello and welcome. <laughs> um, so today we have Katie Hind with us to tell us about the latest in her research. You have been here at ASU for my fifth year. Five years. And she may also tell you a little bit about March Mammal Madness. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, thank you, everybody, for coming uh, to my talk this afternoon. Uh, I'm really excited. Uh, some of the content might be familiar to people that have seen me talk in recent years. Um, some of it will be new. And um, I've really curated this talk to be situated in a space that I'm spending a lot of time uh, trying to understand uh, these phenomena, what's going on, and better situate them at the intersection of an evolutionary perspective and clinical practice, and how um, an evolutionary lens has really opened up a better understanding of how to approach things like lactation biology, both in animal science and medical science. Uh, and I, I want to start with the takeaways. Um, just because I really want you to understand the details um, are, are, it's very much a moving target. So um, this research area of sex differentiated milk synthesis is really new. And the data that you will see in the literature is complicated, muddy, and incomplete. And I also want to emphasize that I'm talking about self, sex, sex differentiated milk synthesis in the form of mothers making a different composition or volume of milk for sons versus daughters. And in my early publications, because I was really strongly influenced by the literature, I would talk about it as a sex bias, that mothers were allocating more effort and energy and resources to sons or daughters under certain circumstances. And I've increasingly come to the conclusion that we cannot be confident in that interpretation of the difference that differences don't necessarily mean biases in this biological context, and that we have to step back and return to first principles and reevaluate the phenomena as we see them. Um, and this is one of the reasons why the data in the literature is particularly muddy, complicated, and incomplete. Um, and I'll go through that and explain why. I want to emphasize that to date, there is no compelling evidence that milk is better in an absolute sense for either sons or daughters. So that's just another way of saying that the difference doesn't mean a bias. The best evidence that we have to date sheds light on some potential breastfeeding challenges that have previously been unaddressed in a clinical setting uh, for supporting mother-infant dyads, and I'll talk about that explicitly. And fundamentally, what we can take away from the evidence as it exists currently is that it reinforces our understanding of breast milk as a biofluid that is synthesized by mothers for their young, that specific infant in that time and that place. So it's important to understand that this is reinforcing why supporting mothers uh, achieving their breastfeeding goals and providing effective breastfeeding supports is the number one way to support mother-infant health at this time. To date, there have been documented differences in milk synthesis broadly across mammals. Uh, so stretching all the way from marsupials uh, to rodents, uh, lots of animal science done in cows and goats. Uh, we've seen work in um, our lab on monkeys and um, a number um, of different kinds of replications across some of these species. So this is a visual representation of the species that have um, been studied. So um, for those of you that don't know, there's like 7,000 mammals. And these are the ones we know about in terms of differences in the milk synthesis for sons and daughters. And when we dig deeper, we'll see that the pattern is, is complicated. It's a nice way to say shallow. Um, so here I've got the species names, uh, Latin binomials, and I just want to orient you to what you're going to see in this graph. You're going to see colored squares that are going to be blue, red, or purple. So if it's blue, it means that there's more of something for sons or more being produced by a mother that um, is rearing a son. If it's red, it means there's more of something for daughters. If it's purple, it means that there's no difference 
um, when measured and published. And if there's multiple colors within a square, it means that different studies have shown different things. And I will just disclose right now that these squares are not scaled to sample size. We will come back to that. Okay. So here is the total knowledge about sex differentiated milk synthesis in the English speaking language, uh, English speaking literature. Not much. What you can see is the biggest takeaway that we have is that there is evidence that mothers are making a richer milk for sons. Uh, so that's in this column here, where right? there's the most data. And this is the energy density of the milk. Um, it's overwhelmingly blue. And this indicates that mothers are making particularly higher concentrations of fat and to a lesser extent, higher concentrations of protein in the milk that they are synthesizing for their sons relative to the milk that is being synthesized for daughters. Almost entirely counterbalancing that, when we look at the aggregate, is that across mammals we're seeing evidence that mothers are producing more milk for daughters. Frustratingly, very few of these studies are measuring the same thing at the same time. So we can't actually combine those two. If they're measured simultaneously, we can, right? So the energy density is the kilocalories per gram of milk. The volume of milk is the total grams that are produced. So you can look at the total caloric production of the mammary gland in a standardized way, but most studies are only looking at composition and isolation, and very few are also combining information about the volume of milk that's produced. This is a problem because I found in the rhesus macaques that I work on, that 95% of the variance in the total calories produced by the mother's mammary gland is explained by the volume, not the energy density. So we know the least about something that is driving the most calorie transfer. We know a little bit about minerals. There's um, increasing information about hormones. And um, there's some really, really nice work out of a group um, in Australia um, led by Alicia Twigger where they've been looking at epithelial cell expression within the mammary gland. And this lets us know about the um, underlying uh, gene expression that's driving the capacity of the mammary gland to synthesize milk. Okay. Also, if anybody has any questions as I go, feel free to ask me. There's no way we're getting to the end of this talk regardless. Okay. <laughs> Full disclosure. <laughs> All right. So I want to talk a bit about the monkeys because this is a space where we've looked at both the composition and the volume together. This is work that I've been doing ongoing for uh, the last 15 years at the California National Primate Research Center. And um, this, uh, I'm going to show you data that comes from 336 mother infant dyads, um, which was really exciting because it over triples what I did for my dissertation. And, uh, and thankfully, we were able to replicate what I found in my dissertation. <laughs> That's always step one. And what we see here is that, in general, on average, mothers are producing less milk for their sons after controlling for important covariates. But not all mothers. We actually see that there's greater variance among mothers of sons in the volume of milk that they're producing. And this is, uh, this, uh, we know that higher parity mothers are producing more milk, but there's no interaction in this, uh, in this outcome. It's just more milk after producing a daughter, regardless of first time moms or experienced moms. It gets more complicated when we look at the milk energy density, the combination of fat, protein, and sugar. There, what you find is first time moms are producing a, a, a particularly dilute milk for their daughters. And once they have gained experience, they produce the same kind of energy density for sons and daughters. First time moms that are rearing sons produce very rich milk. When we put all of this together and actually look at the amount of calories that are produced by the mammary gland in a standardized period of milk accumulation time, what we find is that the models retain whether or not the mother is rearing a son or a daughter. And on average, mothers are producing slightly more um, calories for their daughters than their sons. Question? Beyond the assumption that uh, a mother who's had multiple children is older than a mother who's had one, any further control from maternal age? 
Um, that is a great question. In this, um, in this colony of rhesus macaques, uh, the females generally give birth every year, and uh, the correlation between parity and age is 0.96. Um, and so we tend to go with parity because it's a more physiologically meaningful measure than just chronological age. Um, so it, uh, it, it, so we don't end up actually um, including age in these kinds of models. We've done other studies where we've looked at age of reproductive debut in the rhesus macaques because there's a normal distribution between uh, three, four, and five. And so then we'll look controlling for age at how they're able to function reproductively and, and lactationally um, as a function of age, but they're all controlled for parity. So it's a good question. Uh, so um, uh, Importantly, one of the things that we do control for in these models and largely isn't in the literature is we control for infant mass. And this is tricky because sons are bigger. They're bigger than uh, their sisters. And so when you don't control for the mass of the infant, you don't know if you're actually seeing a sex effect or if you're just seeing an infant size effect, those become conflated. Because we know that the capacity of the mammary gland to synthesize milk is going to be in part driven by the size of the fetal placental unit. And the fetal placental unit is bigger for sons than it is for daughters. So what these data are showing is that per unit offspring mass, mothers are making more calories for their daughters than they are for their sons. Uh, we've also found um, that, uh, okay, so well established in the literature, actually, is that the skeletal development of daughters is accelerated relative to sons in macaques, chimpanzees, and humans. So you can actually look at uh, radiographs of the epiph um, epiphyseal development in their um, long bones, and you can see that daughters are much accelerated relative to sons. And uh, Although we did not have radiographs with this data set, what we find is that the calcium phosphorus ratio in milk is higher for daughters than it is for sons, suggesting that aspects of milk synthesis are helping to support this accelerated skeletal development that we see in daughters. We're gonna come back to that, but I want you to think about that in terms of daughters having accelerated development and sons having larger size at completion of growth. Right. These are different features that are going on, and they may require different maternal investment to achieve those particular life history trajectories. Uh, we could go into, um, which one is this? Okay, so this is stuff on kangaroos. Uh, there's really nice stuff on um, Iberian red deer that's been done um, really robustly. And um, this is, uh, I love the title of this, talk, this lecture, or paper, Lazy Sons and Self-Sufficient Daughters. Um, in uh, Galapagos sea lions, and um, the question is, are sons more demanding? So what you find is in this model system, daughters wean at younger ages. They learn to hunt and um, uh, hunt fish. They learn to be adept in the water uh, many months faster than their brothers do, and brothers stay behind and uh, nurse and get milk for many, many more months. And so you have differential developmental trajectories between sons and daughters that could mean that mothers are biased in favor of sons, or they may be f favoring accelerated development of daughters because of things about their reproductive horizon. So we're gonna come back to that. Question, Sylvie. Yeah, I was just wondering, I don't know if it's known whether when this is being determined, Could you um, hold that for like five more slides? Great question. All right, uh, okay, I'm gonna go through quickly all of the data from humans. Uh, this is work by Cheryl Knott um, at the time at Harvard University, and uh, with her undergraduate honors thesis uh, student, they looked at the composition of milk um, and 25 mother-infant uh, dyads, which is um, a small data set. And what they found was uh, significantly richer milk for sons than daughters. Uh, so the higher fat content, and then because fat is the main caloric contributor to milk slash everything, uh, you had higher energy density. A majority of the moms in this data set were permiparous. Uh, so this, um, this comes up frequently, permiparity and energy density for sons. Uh, 
E.A. Quinn, an anthropologist at the Washington uh, University of St. Louis, um, did really nice work um, with a, over 100 moms in the Philippines. And what she found was no difference between sons and daughters in the composition of milk. None of these studies looked at volume. Uh, um, Peter Hartman's group out of Australia, Western Australia University, uh, did work looking at 71 mother-infant pairs and they found no difference in the fat concentration of milk. And um, they found significantly more milk for sons. This is the only data point that I am aware of for any species that talks about more milk for sons. Okay. That same group then later published the work I mentioned by Alicia Twigger showing that the um, uh, uh, gene regulation within the mammary gland um, seems to be shaping a capacity for more milk for daughters, but they didn't directly measure the milk volume in that study. Um, milk research is really, really hard, so we aren't faulting people for having um, Swiss cheese data, just to be clear. A couple of years ago, um, oh, so this is, this, sorry, this is the takeaway from Twigger. Um, this suggests that these mothers had more lactocytes in their gland, um, and lactocytes determine how much milk can be synthesized. Work that was done um, with an NIH cohort study looked at a series of mother-infant, uh, a series of twin pairs. So the twins were either son-son, daughter-daughter, or son-daughter. And they were all in their early 20s at the time that they looked at these data. And they compared never breastfed individuals. And what they found is that females in female male twin pairs had identical growth to daughter-daughter pairs, or, um, and sons had identical growth to son-sons. In the never breastfed group, they were fed formula. Formula is totally standardized. There's no differences. Everybody grew the same when they were formula fed never got any amount of milk. When you compare it to the group that were breastfed any amount of breast milk, what you find is that females in daughter-daughter pairs attained a greater height and slightly heavier weight than did females in female-son pairs. And similarly, sons in son-son pairs gained different total height than did males in male-female pairs. This is the only evidence to suggest that in humans, there is a breastfeeding organizational feature that is optimized for the growth trajectories of sons and daughters in a differentiated way. And that when it is blended between two uh, genders or sex, it is erased. So, uh, that's, that's the state of the uh, science within humans. How does the mammary gland know that it's, re that it's producing milk for a son or a daughter? The first work and re only cross-fostering study to date was done in bankvilles, which are adorable. And what Koskela and colleagues did, this was an incredibly clever, this is an incredibly clever study. I love this study. What they did is they cross-fostered sons and daughters and made all daughter and all son litters. And then they either gave the mom two extra pups or took away two pups to basically make her work way harder at lactation than she was prepared to from pregnancy or work much less harder than she was prepared to from pregnancy. And they had predicted that mothers um, in, you know, quote unquote better condition that didn't have to work as hard to rear their young would favor sons and um, mothers in worse condition would favor daughters. And yet what they found is regardless of the number of pups, regardless of the mother's condition, all of the bankfuls upregulated their milk synthesis for their daughters. We don't know the mechanism. We just know that there's a postnatal mechanism whereby the mammary gland responds to something about the daughters in a rodent system, likely something olfactory. Okay. All right, so um, that's a postnatal manipulation. We also find that there's a prenatal effect, and that's where we're really going to situate the rest of the talk, because I think that that's going to be a primary driver. So in collaboration with dairy scientists at Kansas State, we looked at um, one and a half million cows 
two and a half million lactation records. Uh, so this is the, the dairy herd management system for uh, US dairy science. And this system allows us to get really good um, access to these phenomena because one, calves are pulled at birth and basically raised on a formula that's known as milk replacer in a separate barn. They don't interact with their mothers. And the mothers are mechanically milked by machinery that has no idea if she produced a son or a daughter, right? So it's totally blind to conditions. Additionally, because this is an economic space and farmers are compensated in part by the caloric content of the milk that their cows are producing, an independent examiner goes to all dairy farms every month and assays the milk for the amount of fat, protein, and sugar. Okay? So what we found is no difference in the composition of the milk for sons and daughters, but across the first five parodies, we, we didn't have data uh, more than that, Mothers produce significantly more milk after producing a daughter. And this controls for things like uh, difficulty of birth, difficulty of labor, difficulty of the pregnancy. Um, because we know that sons are more likely to um, be associated with difficult labors and difficult pregnancies. And, oh, sorry. And when we went deeper into the data, we were able to actually look across lactations in a dynamic way. So on the first parity, females, whether or not they have a son or a daughter, influences their milk production during lactation one. Those cows are artificially inseminated partway through that lactation, and they conceive their next offspring during an established lactation. So we know that that lactation is influenced by the sex of the fetus on the first pregnancy, but the sex of the fetus they conceive during that established lactation alters this milk production dynamic. So after, um, when you conceive a son after a son, a daughter after a son, a son after a daughter, or a daughter after a daughter, what you find is that conceiving a fetal daughter while producing milk for an established lactation increases the volume of milk that that cow is making at that time. Having a daughter on the first, she's indifferent to the presence of the son in her uterus, and having two daughters doesn't seem to amplify it appreciably more, possibly because we're at a ceiling effect within dairy animal science. Don't exactly know. We also know that the mammary gland has modifications within the cellular architecture of uh, the gland that influences the capacity to synthesize milk additively across lactations. And so we predicted that that fetal sex could influence the lactation uh, down the road. And indeed, that's exactly what we found. This is the second lactation. And having um, a daughter after a, uh, having a daughter and then a son increased the milk that was being produced. So within the mammary gland physiology, we end up with a situation that's somewhat like this, um, when there are overlapping pregnancies and lactations. So you have a compounding daughter effect such that across two lactations, a cow that's produced back-to-back -back daughters is producing um, about uh, 100 kilos extra of milk over those lactations, which is granted only about 3% of her total milk production. But when we translate that into animal science economic dollars in the United States, that's $200 million in differences of production. Okay. It also means that the price breakpoint for paying for sex-selected semen for your cow's first pregnancy, if you, so you can have a 90% probability that she'll conceive a daughter on her first pregnancy, it pays to do that for large-scale farmers because it predicts that their cows are going to produce more milk over the next two lactations. Now, the mechanism by which the mammary gland is responding to the presence of a fetal son or a fetal daughter has to be mediated through the placenta. And this is where we don't have a good idea of what those mechanisms are. And I want to talk about how this could potentially be adaptive, but it also could be a constrained system in which daughters have greater ability to influence maternal physiology than do sons. So let's talk about adaptations for biased investment. If you go into the literature, 
you will see extensive discussion about mothers um, synthesizing sex differentiated milk or having sex um, biased effort, whether or not sons and daughters have different developmental priorities, depending on what the cost of rearing sons and daughters might be and her own condition, and what the reproductive potential in terms of, an, of grand offspring are for sons or daughters, a function of reproductive variance for males and females. And um, does anybody want to guess what set of hypotheses about sex-biased maternal investment dominates the literature? Excellent. Good job, Kevin. <laughs> So Trivers Willard is drawing a ton of air in this space. And it really comes down to the expectation that where males have greater reproductive variance in adulthood, uh, we expect mothers with more resources to uh, allocate uh, that extra resource effort toward those sons. However, and this, I can't, all the trainees in the room if you cite that paper, would you please read that paper? It's four pages. It does not take long, okay? Because what is almost always missed is the second predicating assumption of this, this domain, which is that differences in the condition of young at the end of the period of parental investment will tend to endure into adulthood. And this becomes really important because in these kinds of systems where you have really great amounts of reproductive variance in one sex versus the other, Oftentimes, you are seeing very different timelines to that reproductive maturity. And that time depth perspective becomes essential for understanding the extent to which a mother's investment can persist or be squandered by the time the offspring are reproductively mature. We know in many wild living primates, where there's really high reproductive variance among males, much lower reproductive uh, variance among females, we know that maternal condition has greater predictive power of daughter's condition at reproductive maturity than it does for sons. So we can predict that there is the potential for natural selection to shape more adaptations for in investment in daughters where mother's investments are expected to have a greater dividend. So we can expect that there are adaptations potentially favoring daughters in some of these systems in ways that have been habitually overlooked in the literature. But I also want us to not lose sight of the fact that the placenta and pregnancy has all sorts of adaptations that are operating that may facilitate fetal daughters influence the mother in ways that may or may not be adaptive. So we know that fetal daughters are producing estrogens, and those can cross into maternal circulation, where they can bind to receptors within the mother's mammary gland. And we know that those estrogen levels are shaping the capacity of the mammary gland to synthesize milk during lactation. Sons could also aromatize their testosterone and make that estrogen and also signal to the mother's mammary gland in ways that are going to cause it to make him more milk when he's born. But to do that, they would absolutely sterilize their own gonadal development, which outside some cooperative insects is generally not a good strategy, right? Mammals don't do that. So is it that mothers are favoring daughters? Is it that daughters have greater uh, capacity to influence the mother's physiology? Is it that daughters are sending a really amplified estrogen signal and mothers are down-regulating their estrogen uh, receptors in the mammary gland during their daughter pregnancies versus their son pregnancies? So they're actually discounting a signal from the daughter? We don't know any of that. And we also don't know if it's just a byproduct of placental physiology within these systems. Now, a lot of the species that we have information about sex-differentiated investment are characterized by more invasive placentas and more invasive placentas are gonna afford more opportunity for fetal physiology to pass into maternal circulation. But this can't be all of the story because we also have sex differentiated milk synthesis coming from marsupials, which have wispy, pathetic, very ephemeral placentas. We don't even really call them that, right? But we don't say there's no placenta. So it's a complicated system. All right, I'm actually gonna make good time. So 
I think that at this juncture, we must remain agnostic about whether or not this phenomenon represents an adaptation or a constraint byproduct. But regardless, we expect that daughter and son pregnancies and, and, and infants are going to have influences potentially on the mammary gland. And so the question becomes, if we used a robust sample size, what might it look like in terms of breastfeeding outcome if mothers are somewhat handicapped in their capacity to synthesize milk for sons? And uh, in collaboration with Megan Azad, who is amazing at the University of Manitoba, she's an um, epidemiologist and statistician, uh, we outlined our, our, our predictions. So if the mammary gland is handicapped in milk synthesis in humans the way we're seeing in the monkeys and the dairy cows, we would expect sons would be more likely to be formula fed. We would expect that sons would have solids introduced at younger ages. We'd expect sons to get weaned at younger ages, so get no milk at younger ages. And we'd expect that mothers would have a greater probability of perceiving milk uh, insufficiency or lactational inadequacy when they're re rearing a son versus a daughter, and um, that they would seek clinical advice and um, medication like domperidone, which is used for um, inadequate milk supply. Um, spoiler alert, we substantiated all of these predictions in a data set of 15,000 subjects. So uh, using a cohort out of the UK and a cohort out of Canada, um, um, all together with actually um, like 17, 18,000 pregnancies, we looked at all of these outcomes. Um, oh, and please, all of this is unpublished, so please don't tweet it. Um, it's important for maintaining access to the cohort studies. So. Uh, I do want to point out that um, breastfeeding rates and persistence in the UK in the 90s um, was particularly dismal. And um, in the 2000 uh, aughts um, in Canada, it's, it's much better. So you have kind of different breastfeeding cultures between these two places, overwhelmingly white, overwhelmingly college educated, overwhelmingly um, uh, middle income. And, in this data set, what's really important is that there was no difference between mothers of sons and mothers and daughters and their intention to breastfeed. They wanted to breastfeed for the same, uh, to, they wanted to initiate breastfeeding at the same rates and they wanted to sustain breastfeeding for the same length of time in, this, in, these, in both of these data sets. But by four months of age, boys were less likely to be exclusively breastfed and um, this pattern was the same across both cohorts. So, Here's a stacked bar graph. Uh, the cooler colors have to do with breastfeeding. The redder, warmer colors have to do with formula. Again, you see that the amount of breastfeeding is, uh, is absolutely higher in Canada than it is in uh, the UK. But in all of these, lower in the graph is more breast milk and more breastfeeding. What you find is that there's more of that being allocated to daughters than to sons, right? despite the, the, the same intentions. When we look at it longitudinally, so dashed lines here are, um, are uh, um, let me think what these are. So dashed lines are females and solid lines are, are males. Uh, what you find is any amount of breastfeeding is higher for longer for daughters. Um, uh, any amount of formula is higher for longer for sons. And the absolute age at weaning is younger for sons. When we put these into, um, uh, to look at the effect sizes relative to other things that we know are highly predictive of breastfeeding outcomes, what we find is that whether or not a mother is, like having a son, having a son reduces breastfeeding uh, achievement to the same extent as obesity, a traumatic birth experience like an emergency C-section, maternal smoking, or lower mother's education levels. Okay. And uh, this is uh, across formula feeding, introduction of solids, duration, and um, the big takeaway here, which you can read that if you want, but it's a lot of words. We know in baby-friendly hospitals that are designed and, and orchestrated to support breastfeeding initiation, good latch, good bonding, and breastfeeding at discharge. So number of steps that make it uh, a 
baby-friendly hospital. We know that in those hospitals, lactation counselors, consultants, educators, and clinicians are aware of risk factors for poor breastfeeding outcomes. Obesity, traumatic birth experience, C-section, uh, maternal smoking, uh, poor maternal education level attainment. And they target those moms for extra information and better lactation support. But nobody is talking about whether or not the mom has a son or a daughter as an important risk factor for different breastfeeding outcomes. So we're hoping that um, as soon as we get this published that we can start influencing um, better recognition of this as a space where really supporting lactation the first few days is going to be quite important for extending that breastfeeding. Okay. Um, all right, I'm now going to talk a little bit about why we have lactation counselors in the first place right? and why it's so important in high-income countries uh, like the U.S. and Canada uh, to have targeted clinical support in this space. And that's because learning to breastfeed is actually not an innate instinctual thing in humans. There are common myths that exist among the general public who has never breastfed. They are that breastfeeding is natural and therefore shouldn't need to be learned, right? Because people conflate natural with automatic or innate. It's wrong. Um, and that there's also this dialogue that breastfeeding difficulties are limited to women in the West who don't experience breastfeeding before giving birth. So you're seeing a lot of public health messaging around normalizing breastfeeding initiatives. Um, these are not true. Right. However, until our paper, this wasn't systematically broken down. Right. So this is a paper I wrote with Brooke Skelza at UCLA. And it was a case study among um, perinatal support among Hindu mothers. And it's quite, it, the Hindu are really an interesting subsistence population to study this in. So these, um, the community we worked with is in the Omahanga Basin up in north, uh, northwest Namibia, um, near the Angola border. Uh, this population is still maintaining, adamantly, intentionally maintaining their traditional lifestyle of goat and cow pastoralism, uh, small-scale horticulture in a semi-arid desert region. 100% of mothers breastfeed within this population. And I don't know of a population where breastfeeding is more normalized because their traditional wardrobe involves only a skirt. So they never wear tops and babies can nurse whenever they want. So moms will be gra uh, grinding uh, different kinds of grains. They'll be sitting there and the baby sits next to them and can nurse. They carry the baby with them everywhere they go. They co-sleep safely every night with the baby. It is the most normal thing, breastfeeding. So it was a fantastic population to ask about whether or not mothers experience breastfeeding challenges. Um, here's some more um, contextualization of uh, their life ways. And um, one of the key things that you see in this population is a period known as Amwari. So when Himba women are approaching the end of their pregnancy, they leave their marital compound where they live with their husband and, and his extended family, and they relocate to their mother's compound, and they stay with their mother through the labor and delivery and for weeks or months afterwards. And there's two cultural practices that facilitate Amwari. One is uh, you can have multiple marriages within the Himba, so men can have multiple wives, and Brooks' work has shown that men that have uh, two or more wives don't come and fetch their wife home from her mother's house as quickly as husbands who only have one wife. So when you talk to women about, is it useful to have a co-wife, they say, yeah, I can travel more and go visit my mother and I get to stay there longer after pregnancy. This is quite important because during this period, their mothers cook for them, help them with the baby, and allow the mother to, to basically allocate all of her energy throughput only to lactation and healing from the pregnancy and parturition. The other thing that the Hemba practice is if a husband prevents his wife from going and visiting her mother for Amwari and anything happens to the wife or the baby, he owes his mother-in-law a cultural fine um, in the form of multiple goats. So uh, there, it is, a, it is a codified cultural practice 
um, that, that if you depart it, carries potential risk in many ways. So we asked moms about um, whether or not they struggled with learning to breastfeed, what kind of problems they reported, and how did they overcome these struggles. And um, we, we, it's a small population, so we talked to um, 25 moms. And they could answer multiple things. But what you found was they talked about latch and positioning, supply issues, pain, um, to a less extent, fear and anxiety, um, mastitis, infant illness, and then uh, one mother complained of lack of sleep. If you taught anybody that's had babies here and breastfed, I would expect that this list would look very familiar to you because these are the standard struggles that uh, women in the United States and Canada and um, throughout the world are experiencing. And um, particularly what you see in uh, places where mothers have access to artificial breast milks or formulas, there is substantial concern about perceptions of inadequate supply. So Himba women are worried about it, but they don't turn to formula because it's not within their, their local ecology in the same way that it is here. And so managing expectations of production and supply is a really important clinical component of effective breastfeeding support. Um, skip that. So what we fundamentally found is that grandmothers are 24-hour lactation consultants. And they're there. Um, so these are quotes from Himba women. So during the night when the baby would cry, she would wake me up. My, her mother would wake me up and tell me to start breastfeeding. I didn't know how to breastfeed or how to hold him. My mom showed me how to put the baby to my breast. She told me to sit, not lie down, to feed. And when I was scared, she told me how to get the baby to unlatch without pain. Okay. So when you look at ethnographies across human cultures, where people thought to ask, ask these questions, and since so much of anthropology was done by men for so long, there's not always as much question about this as you would like. We find that overwhelmingly, women are with their female relatives, typically their own mother, when they give birth and in the weeks after parturition. This is part of the adaptive, cultural, physiological, reproductive suite of human um, reproduction. And it's something that's almost entirely been erased by medicalization of birth. We also had several generations in the mid-20th century where women were told not to breastfeed, that formula was better and safer for their baby. And so you had several generations of erased knowledge within matrilines for providing breastfeeding support to adult daughters. So um, I do have time. I want to spend a couple more minutes to just touch on something that we're now working on. I spent all of this time talking about potentials for sex differentiated uh, milk synthesis in the mom. That's only one side of the dynamic. The other side is that moms can be producing identical milk for sons and daughters, but at a physiology within sons and daughters may use that signal from the mom in different ways. So I've been looking extensively at cortisol, glucocorticoids within milk, and what we find is I'm going to rush through this part because it's all published. We find that higher concentrations of milk cortisol are associated with uh, different temperaments, um, but that the windows of sensitivity for sons and daughters are different. Uh, so here are those data. Um, we find that um, higher milk cortisol is associated with differences in social behavior and cognitive performance. Um, Again, there seems to be some sex differentiated aspects of that. And uh, so this is a cognitive task where sons, and, or this is a social behavior. And yet these differences in cortisol being associated with later infant outcomes is not because moms are making different cortisol concentrations or volumes in the milk that they're producing. So the cortisol signal from mom to sons and daughters seems to be identical. But sons and daughters have different magnitudes of sensitivity and different windows of sensitivity. So trainees in the room, if you would like a really straightforward, maybe not that straightforward. Everybody that doesn't do genetics is always like, genetics, they're super straightforward. I know it's not. <laughs> if you want a very um, clearly outlined study, we can now recover intestinal epithelial cells
from primate feces in infants, and you can look at um, intestinal tract glucocorticoid receptors and look for different um, receptor expression for glucocorticoids um, for sons and daughters because it's going to be in the gut or it's going to be in the brain or both. And um, it's not evasive to work with feces, so it's fun to rule that out before you start trying to do things with brains. So when we put all this together, um, we had a series of hypotheses that mother's milk in part is organizing the behavior and temperament of young and um, we expect that to be a somewhat uh, a system with some feedback. And that that behavioral cognitive temperament calibration in infancy would be predictive of responses to challenge and neuroenergetics in, in adolescence. So we basically thought glucocorticoids in milk are going to organize uh, areas of the brain that influence the temperament, and that's we can measure the temperament. And then we're going to follow them for several more years, and we're going to expect that temperament to carry forward. And so um, the predictions were specifically that the sex differentiated windows of sensitivity and magnitude of sensitivity would be different between um, sons and daughters. And that we expected that this was going to be, um, that the pathway for this was going to be through the temperament. We didn't think that it would necessarily be directly related to milk that was received in infancy. And we became really interested in the amygdala, the nucleus accumbens, uh, anterior cingulate, caudate, patame, and hippocampus, prefrontal cortex, and the hypothalamus, um, because in macaques and humans, these brain regions have been implicated in the same kinds of cognitive temperament and um, uh, behavioral phenotypes that we were seeing organized in infancy. And I say organized, um, even though I do correlational studies, um, there's parallel work that's being done by other labs and rodents that's more experimental, and our findings are largely consistent. And so by aggregating existing knowledge, I think we can feel um, pretty confident that there is, in some ways, organizational capacity of the milk on the neuro uh, development. So uh, we measure, we put the monkeys into uh, PET scanners, and we measure glucose uptakes in regions of the brain, so neuroenergetics, because it's measuring glucose use in these regions of the brain. Uh, we then, uh, within a short period of time, put them through an MRI, and then uh, using neuroatlases, we were able to draw um, borders on our regions of interest, and then co-register the PET with the MRI data so that we could understand the glucose uptake specifically in the regions of interest. And uh, so these are all the different, it's just so pretty. <laughs> like there's, you get nothing from this other than like art. <laughs> and uh, we had 35 subjects that were available to do this study, or not available. We selected 35 subjects because it's stupid expensive. And we, um, we followed like a mini kind of model where you take the extreme phenotypes um, to uh, so that you expect the greatest amount of variation in these things. Uh, and then um, we did all of this before they, in, they entered adolescence and initiated reproductive careers. And um, so highest and lowest quartiles for temperament. And what we find is that in actuality, our neural measures were more linked to the milk they received in infancy than they were to any, anything about their temperament. When we looked at it in males and females, we found that males had much more of their neuroenergetics associated with the milk they received from their mother. And we also found that the windows of sensitivity, like when the milk seemed to be critical for predicting these correlations, um, were different. So we're finding the same kinds of patterns both in the behavioral phenotype and the neuroenergetic measures that sons and daughters have differentiated windows of sensitivity and sons are more sensitive to mother's milk and organizing these dimensions of, of their phenotype. Uh, so our predictions were not, our, we were less ambitious in our predictions than the data turned out to suggest. And uh, so we're interested now in doing more fine-grained analyses of that milk because those findings are just related to the total calories that are being produced. And we also have rich um, adolescent behavior, which obviously this is, everything that works at Kayo knows this is Kayo. This is not my population, but that picture is prettier. And uh, so um, I would like to take two minutes to just talk about March Mammal Madness really quickly, and then I will take your questions. So um, 
Ever since 2013, I've been running a science outreach activity called March Mammal Madness. Um, Ann Stone, uh, Annalie Perry is a librarian at ASU. Um, uh, Melissa Wilson is uh, a geneticist on the team. It's now a team of like 50 people. And our bracket drops tomorrow. And uh, we've had a series of champions, but I want to talk about this as really effective science outreach. So um, people are entertained. They are learning. Um, in 2019, 3,000 educators distributed this tournament to 245,000 learners. 95% uh, of them are in the United States. A majority of them are in high school biology classes. Um, we've now exceeded all of these numbers for 2020 and the tournament doesn't start for another two weeks. We are reaching the United States in proportion to the student population. So this um, science outreach activity that spends extensive amount of time talking about conservation, climate crisis, uh, protecting research dollars, protecting uh, uh, lands, and uh, demonstrating inclusive science um, is throughout the United States. And uh, we know that students are using the resources we provide. So these are the number of um, page views for the ASU library guide that's been created here, um, providing access to resources to K through 12 students. And um, we do overrepresent carnivores and primates. <laughs> um, so this is, um, these are the different mammalian uh, um, orders within the mammalian class. And this is what is featured in Marshmallow Madness. And um, I routinely get chastised by people that study rodents and bats because they're not really there as much as you would expect based on random distribution. Um, but we have been able to proportionally or even disproportionately over-represent some of the really, really rare clades. And uh, the 2020 bracket drops tomorrow. But if you come up and talk to me after this and promise not to leak anything online, I maybe have brackets today. So thank you, everyone. I have five minutes for questions. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, great talk. Great talk. Love having you here. Uh, I have a couple of questions. Hopefully they'll be quick. First off, when you were studying human populations, did you see any effect that diet ha had on your results? Uh, that's a great question. Uh, we've looked at um, subsistence patterns. And the tricky thing with, and, and what we find is subsistence patterns are associated with um, immune factors in breast milk, complex sugars in breast milk, mineral content in breast milk. Um, it doesn't, we don't have sample sizes to be able to talk about uh, sex differentiated effects. Um, the tricky part about using subsistence pattern as um, the proxy for nutritional ecology is that subsistence pattern is also a marker of disease ecology. So um, what we eat um, is really intimately associated with what pathogens we're exposed to. And so these, these two kind of go together. Um, and uh, that's all been published. You can email me or you can... Um, the work was um, done by Laura Klein, a graduate student in my lab, and um, so we've published three of those papers so far. We've got one more coming out. And yeah. uh, my other question was, I was curious about when, when you showed us that graph with the cows, like, like son, 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 daughter, et cetera, uh, what, do you expect this would like continuously fluctuate if they like had more, more than two ca cows? Yeah, so um, yeah, that's a really good question. What we'd expect is that um, it would sequentially, the effect sizes would sequentially be eroded in part um, just because you'd have more combinations of son daughter orders, um, probabilistically. Uh, that study has now been replicated in like five different national dairy herds. Uh, so Switzerland, Turkey, Iran, uh, Canada, um, and we're seeing it pretty consistently. Um, most dairy cows are retired after the third pregnancy. Um, and there's actually a, there's a, a third 
a third of a call, a third of a breeding population is lost after every parity um, in industrialized dairying for a variety of reasons I could talk about. Um, we did um, in the paper we talk about um, the hormones that a lot of dairy cows are given to amplify their milk production. And what we find is that hormone intervention uh, washes out the, the sex effect of the offspring. They're, they're basically pushed up against uh, a ceiling effect from that hormonal manipulation. Uh, so it, it ends up swamping it. But as that practice is declining in the US and has been abandoned in lots of places in the world, um, we're probably going to see more potential for more fine grains kinds of biological phenomena. Good questions. We're up against it, I realized. But great talk, super thought-provoking. And I had some um, more macroevolutionary um, thoughts. Okay. Um, so it sounds like you're pretty sad or disappointed in the data set quality for the comparative data set. Um, I, 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 I'm enthusiastic okay. for future discoveries. Okay. <laughs> because it seems like there's a real you know, kind of ripe theoretical you um, know, structure that could be put in there, you know, even if you think about like sexually selected traits. Yeah. So, Operational sex ratio, mating system type, yeah. you know, sexual size dimorphism, other things that mm -hmm. might predict variation across clays or species. Absolutely. Um, I, I'm routinely uh, daunted by how dismal the milk composition literature is yeah. across mammals. I mean, we're really most, when you actually start looking at like, so there's mm, 150 mammals who've had any degree of their milk synthesis described. Mm -hmm. and, um, and often it's from zoo populations, and often the ends are three or lower, and often it's at various times during lactation, and almost none of those papers ever report whether it's a son or a daughter. So uh, the, this literature is just really, really shallow, and I, I'm not, I'm, there's constraints in studying it. It's been underappreciated, under underfunded. Right. I'm more frustrated by uh, the hubris in uh, what should be said much more speculatively than what is in the literature. So you see a lot of strong uh, assertions about the sex bias investment that mothers are doing that I don't think is justified. So I'm much more, f that's why I really emphasize how shallow the literature is in terms of data so that we are more humble in our interpretations of it. And that is definitely directed at myself in some of my <laughs> early publications. I was like, this is what's going on. And it's, 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 it's probably not. Okay. All right. okay. So maybe the data are better in humans comparing traditional versus modern societies. Um, right. A lot of the theory predicts that maternal condition or condition of the population, even condition of the father can drive investments, sex biased investments. So mm -hmm, mm -hmm. has that framework been superimposed on any of the data sets? No. But it's great. It's a great point. And and um, so and you bringing that up and I didn't mention this because it makes I was really excited when this was replicated across a lot of different national herds because um, ten percent of um, the U.S. dairy herd are progeny from one bull a hundred years ago, or like descendants of. And so I know, like that. I forget his name. He's got some like, like, like it's man of war, but it's not man of war. It's like some like really badass name. And uh, his genes are just really strongly represented in the U.S. dairy herd. And it's something that we'd want to know about. And I think. Animal science is going to be the place where we can really get into the machinery of these kinds of things. They keep fantastic records. The downside is that there's so much else going on to, to, to exaggerate the phenotype. Um, it's such an artificially selected system that it's, it's, it's one of the pathways that you can use with others. But I think you're absolutely right. Yeah, I mean, certainly the, you know, the bird literature, if you ignore maternal condition, you know, some of these patterns just go away, right? That they can yeah. Be rescued or, or uncovered when you consider? For, I would argue, cultural reasons in the US, animal science has been slow to integrate with animal biology um, in terms of bringing theoretical perspectives to phenomena. They're very phenomenologically driven and um, don't even really think of things in terms of life history theory. So there was this amazing researcher, Soberon, out of Cornell. And um, so, it, so calves are dropped, they go to the calf, 
the calf barn, their fed milk replacer, and their ration of milk replacer is a function of their, of their birth mass. Right? That's what they do. But in industrialized dairying, cows are dropping calves year round. And what they were finding is the growth trajectories of summer calves were way higher than the growth trajectories of winter calves because they were getting the same amount of calories, but the thermoregulatory demands on the winter calves were way higher. And this was predictive of their capacity for milk production in adulthood such that their growth during calfhood had seven times the influence on their milk production than their genetics. And um, this got published in 2009, and it was revolutionary in dairy science. And it was like, it's basic life history theory, right? And so, um, so I think we're going to, there's already, like, we're seeing more collaborations across these um, disciplinary approaches um, just because it's, it's, it's um, a shortcut to greater return on investment. Right? So rather than just doing a whole bunch of a theoretical guess and check, which has been driving a lot of dairy science, when you integrate an evolutionary perspective, you're, you're basically shortcutting what you guess and check. Anyway, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.